It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 324 of Science on Top. Today is Monday the 25th of February 2019. I'm Ed Brown and with me today is Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hello. And this is part seven of our 10-week campaign supporting the Fred Hollows Foundation and Doctors Without Borders. Uh, We're doing this in memory of a good friend of ours and a listener to the show, Penelope Green. She passed away late last year and we're donating all of the uh, Patreon contributions we get for 10 weeks to those charities in her honour. If you want to be a part of that, just head to scienceontop.com slash donate. Tell people about it. Say, you should come and donate to Science on Top because you are, in fact, donating to Fred Hollows and Doctors Without Borders. Tell your friends. Tell your enemies. Tell them all. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone. Yeah. Uh, great causes. And, of course, as I said, she was a dear friend of ours and this is our way of remembering her and leaving a legacy. Do average people have enemies? Or is that kind of... Is that just me? <laughs> I think average people have enemies. You and I, we have nemesis. Nemeses. Ne- <laughs> nemeses. Ne- yeah. <laughs> Let's begin, Lucas, with a look at the Hayabusa 2 mission, which was Japan's second attempt to grab a sample from an asteroid. Now, the first mission... Uh, successfully retrieved a sample from a near-Earth asteroid in 2005, and that sample landed back on Earth in 2010. But a lot of things did go wrong. There were communication dropouts, mechanical and electronic failures. We ended up only getting like a few grains of dust from that asteroid. And now Hayabusa 2, which we've mentioned before on the show, was the successor to that first mission, and it's now briefly landed on the asteroid Ryugu. And it's it's been a really ambitious mission, but it's also, so far at least, been a really successful one, hasn't it? Yes. I. Uh, it's So it's done what you might call just a touch-off so far, but things have not gone to plan. Um, and and I, I love talking about... I love talking about engineering challenges like this, but I also often love anything that relates to the incredible outcomes and incredible planning that um, that is characteristic of so many of these probe missions. You look at the orbital mechanics and planning that are required to get something to a freaking moving asteroid. Um, that's awesome in itself. And we've got a few, you know, we've had, we've had a bit of um, bit of experience with getting things to asteroids now. We've also had a bit of experience with uh, with sampling from asteroids, as you said, Hayabusa one, or you know, its predecessor. Things didn't quite go to plan with that one either, and and it's basically its impact have failed because um, it was meant to fire a, a piece of metal into the into the um, uh, the asteroid, and 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 the ejector would would basically be uh, you know. Um, thrown up from the surface and because of the microgravity environment uh, that was expected that the ejector would some of it would settle into the sample collection chamber um, the the impact didn't work so what little sample they got was actually just just blown up by the thrusters when they when the um, when the spacecraft landed so this time they had uh, intended to have three sampling um, moments, if you like, three three little submissions. Um, two of them were meant to be similar to that first one, where they they fire a thing and the thing causes stuff to 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 float. And then in this case, they had this sort of horn shaped um, proboscis, which which would be sort of over the ejector area. And so as the thing would be fired through the proboscis, I think. It would impact, and then because this horn-shaped proboscis was over the top, it would basically shoot up inside it and end up in the sampling container. How's this? The desired amount for sampling, for successful sampling for each of these two attempts, is 0.1 grams of material. 0.1 grams of material. Whoa. 
That's, that's a spec. That's adjust. a lot more. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot more than they got from the first one. Each of the containers can actually it has a capacity of up to ten grams per sample. So we're not talking a lot of a lot of uh, material here. Funnily enough, there's uh, another uh, mission, Osiris Rex, which is going to a, a different asteroid, Bennu, and it's going to uh, collect um, in in the realm of kilograms of material, which is like whoa, okay, totally different sort of uh, <laughs> to, totally different objective there. But yeah, point 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 one gram. Per, per thing will be considered a success. Wow, that just stuns me. And then it's, the material yeah. that they bring back to Earth in 2020, it's meant to be landing in the Australian outback. In 2020, the material they bring back will be then shared amongst um, JAXA, who are running this mission, and NASA, who are running OSIRIS-REx, because there's a you know share and share alike sort of deal between them. So mm -hmm. so NASA is which is going to be really interesting to see the differences between the two asteroids. I don't know if we know much about their composition or anything, but even if they're completely different, it's going to be fascinating to see how they're different in terms. Yeah, of their so they have similar composition. They're both. Um, basically carboniferous um, uh, type uh, asteroids. So the, the objectives here are actually looking for organics, which is pretty cool because we've not done that before. Um, so they're looking mm. for, for uh, water in the sample, which of course would be ice. They're looking for organic um, molecules and compounds, which would then, you know, obviously the building blocks of life. And and part of the reason for that, part of why they're looking for that and why they've gone for this type of asteroid is because the current theories as to what delivered these things to Earth in the first place are this type of asteroid. So these asteroids were, were effectively, um, they came to being when our solar system formed. So they're really, really old. Um, unlike the the previous uh, sample return mission, which was a, a, an asteroid that was that, that formed much, much earlier in, in uh, the solar system's formation. So this one should have kind of that base material um, that, you know, that's thought to have hit Earth during that heavy bombardment period. It's also thought that these asteroids brought to Earth a lot of the water that's in our oceans. And, and that's, you know, this is a sign of the evolving um, uh, hypotheses and theories as to how, you know, Earth got what it's got because obviously we've got quite a bit of water here, but, um, you know, it's not a lot compared to Earth's mass. It's a tiny, tiny amount to Earth's mass. And I've seen really cool illustrations before showing what happens if you suck all of Earth's water off into a separate sphere and put it next to Earth. Yeah. It's tiny. There's so little water on Earth, you don't realise how small it is. Um, so it's thought that, you know, we, we used to thought that, that most of that came – by way of comets that would have impacted Earth, that doesn't appear to be the case. So it's now, you know, the, the more likely scenario is that it came with asteroids. And because of the way that Earth formed, um, yeah, most of this has to have come later after it initially formed and, and cooled from its molten mass. So, you know, this is this is why we're looking for these things. Now, in terms of the the engineering, I said I love the engineering of these things. Um, it's got it's got those two projectiles that I mentioned before, which are um, as I say they're fired and they, they I believe they're on a some sort of um, like a, a lead. So if they fire in and, and I assume they retract back, although I haven't found a description of exactly what happens with that. Um, so like they're a my harpoon. Yeah, harpoon. Exactly. Thank you. I can think of a word for it. Um, so those those two are made of a particular metal which actually I can't find on my screen now, even though I have marked it Tantalum? Before. Tantalum. Tan tantalium? Tan yeah. So that that um, I found out in my reading, because I've never heard of this material, <laughs> it sounds as much like unobtainium as you could get. Um, it is <laughs> very rare, but it has certain characteristics. One, it's chemically inert. Two, it doesn't corrode. It's very resistant to corrosion. So it is primarily used apparently in laboratories for those two reasons and also it's used in mobile phones for some reason so um so there you go that's that's where that goes now there's another projectile though which is so those those tan what are they tantalum 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 those, yep. those tantalum bullets if you like or projectiles are, are just five grams and they'll be fired at well it, it was fired one's already happened at about 300 meters per second um but the other one is is pretty cool. The other one's a two and a half kilogram copper bullet, um, which will be shot into the surface at very high velocity. 
Um, the intention of this one is to do something that's never been done before, which is to basically uncover materials that are not on the surface. They're below the surface. It's going to make an impact crater. And that impact crater, we're then, they're then going to, you know, deploy the lander and, and basically gather some of that material from the crater. So that's really cool. That's, I mean, wow. I keep thinking of this is all happening and it's all pre-programmed, right? That well, not pre, like, you know, it's pre-programmed when it happens. It's not, it hasn't necessarily been programmed right now. But um, all of this stuff has to happen autonomously. Now, I work in business process automation and, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's often a challenge to get certain data off a page or a screen or something like that and get it to, to do what you want it to do. Compare that to this. Um, it's like we work with with Duplo blocks, um, you know, compared to the the amount of engineering and 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 planning that would have to go into this sort of thing, and that just blows my mind. I think that's just so incredibly cool, and and you know, a lot of the press, a lot of the things that we, you know, that we give um, coverage to relates to human space you know, exploration, but man, this is where it's at. I, I love it. I mean, the human stuff is cool because it's great. It's the, it's the, it, you know, it, it fits into our sci-fi dreams and stuff like that. But mm. this, this is just so freaking cool that we can do this sort of thing. So the, this, this other impactor, I've, I've heard it described as a um, kinetic uh, penetrator, <laughs> which I just, found, <laughs> I just found very funny because I'm childish. Um, so the kinetic <laughs> penetrator uh, will penetrate. Um, it gets launched by four and a half kilos of, of basically plastic explosive, um, and, and it fires at uh, about 500 metres um, uh, from, from an altitude of about 500 metres. And then while that happens, basically the, the spacecraft itself is going to slingshot around the other side of the uh, asteroid so that it doesn't get hit by debris that would be, you know, ejected by this this uh, impact crater. And then so it'll, it'll hang out there for about two weeks, then it will it'll come back around and deploy the, the landing operation and, and pick up the stuff. So, oh, that's just so cool. Um, in terms of what we'll get out of that, we won't know. We won't know. It won't be until it comes back in around um, sort of the end of 2020 is when it's meant to fly past Earth and it will basically eject um, a capsule we're containing these samples. Um, and the capsule will land, but spacecraft won't land. The spacecraft will actually continue, and it does have a potential extended mission because it will have quite a bit of fuel left. It uses an ion drive, um, which has been on some really cool spacecraft in the past. Um, it's, it's part of the Star Trek lore as well, the ion drive, very fast. Um, so that the, the characteristic of this drive is they, they use very little fuel, but they... They, um, they accelerate very, very slowly, as in, you know, there's a bit of acceleration, but it goes on and on and on and on. So they can reach really, really fast speeds. So it's possible and it's, it's, it's you know, it's hoped that this spacecraft will then be used to maybe go and image some other um, candidate, you know, asteroids or, or other things that we might be interested in because it does have other, other um, instruments on it as well. So, yeah, okay. um, it's pretty cool. Uh, as I said, the the uh, things didn't quite go to plan. They when they got there, the the original plan for this mission was they thought that the asteroid would be would basically be covered in regolith, which is which was the case for the the, the previous mission. Uh, so so regolith, sort of gravel, yeah, gravelly yeah. dust, yeah. sort of dusty, really just fine. It, it's kind of coarse dust, really more than more than mm -hmm. gravel. So it's the same sort of stuff that's on the surface of the moon which um, we've heard descriptions of this from some of the Apollo astronauts. That stuff was just highly, highly um, abrasive because it doesn't, it's not rounded off. So, so tiny little molecules of sand on Earth, for example, are rounded mm. off from weathering, but you don't have that in space. So these tiny little grains are all really, really sharp as well because they don't get weathered. And that means that, you know, if you think of the, the, um, the Apollo astronauts going to the moon with effectively cloth outer suits. That mm. stuff is pretty uh, pretty damaging to them. So um, so yeah, that's that's sort of the material that they were expecting. When they got there though, they had a because uh, it arrived um, you know mid last mid to late last year, um, and when it got there, they did a whole lot of imaging because the intention was to choose some landing sites, you know, choose the impactor sites. 
and they discovered it wasn't what they were expecting. It was actually covered in all sorts of boulders. Now, this caused some concern, and they ended up doing some testing back on Earth last year where they did some some uh, simulations and some actual tests on Earth using a similar sort of terrain just to see what, what could happen to the ejector when they fire one of these um, penetrators into the <laughs> sorry, I just can't stop saying that word. They 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 fire these into the, um, into the surface, and um, what they found was that the existence of these boulders can basically cause things to sort of bounce around and not end up where you want them mm-hmm. to go. So this is why they went from having three sample collection attempts to just two. Um, they they changed their uh, their intention, and and what they did is they actually deployed. They they picked a site, and in order to guide it to exactly where they wanted the sample. Uh, collection to occur, they actually deployed some reflectors, and those were then used to, to for laser guidance um, um, instruments to to help guide the uh, spacecraft mm-hmm. to where it needed to go. So just again, all of these moving parts that just have to do yeah. the right thing and work in the right way, and all completely autonomously because this is like light minutes away. We we don't know until after mm-hmm. it's all done and dusted, so to speak. As to whether it works. And, so. and doing all this in microgravity, because obviously this is a little asteroid, it doesn't have a huge gravitational pull, uh, no atmosphere to factor in, and all these other things that are, it's, it's also, it's moving. So you're orbiting a moving object. It's uh, an impressive feat. But I, I do have to wonder I mean, we've sent a chemical laboratory to Mars with Curiosity and things. Do we need to be getting stuff all the way from asteroids uh, all the way back to Earth? Can't we just study them there in situ? Uh, it's a good question, and 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 you know, as you said, we've got we've got certain um, missions out there that have got laboratories on them. So Mars Curiosity is a great example of that. Mars Curiosity is built-in laboratory equipment, which is able to do all sorts of tests on what it what it collects. So there's certain things that we can we can infer, right? So we we don't we can't directly measure them, but we can infer them. This is how a lot of the discoveries that Cassini made helped us understand the formation of Saturn's rings, and it helped us discover the the ice geysers effectively from Enceladus. Um, you know, there were things that we were able to infer based on the instruments we have and the observations we could make without being able to directly measure them. Now, with a probe such as this. The intention, one of the one of the things we want to get to the bottom of is a the molecular makeup of of, of these things that have that have, we've been, we've collected, but also we want to age them. We want to figure out how old they are, and that's really not possible with 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 miniaturized laboratory equipment. Um, we, we've got mm. certain. Um, uh, laboratories on the planet that are kind of room sized that are used to do this sort of work. So at the moment, there's just no way technologically to achieve it. The other thing is, if you can contrast it, say, to um, the Apollo landings, which which we talked about before. That, so the Apollo landings, a whole lot of space were brought back, not just rocks, regolith, all sorts of things. There was, I think, 300 and something kilos. There was a huge amount of stuff hmm. that was brought back from the moon, even though <laughs> we didn't go there. Uh, anyway. So um, <laughs> some people say we didn't go there. But anyway, we somehow got 300 kilos or so of material back from uh, from the moon. And for the longest time, even though these have been tested on Earth, for the longest time, if you, if you remember, it wasn't that long ago, we found out that there is actually water on the moon. And some of that was through sending probes back to the moon and impacted things and some some other missions that took place. But some of it was also from reanalyzing those samples that were brought back by the Apollo mission some 40 years after it occurred because there was new techniques and new equipment that was available to analyze the samples. So those samples are amongst the most valuable, priceless really, things on Earth because of the information they contain. And there are certain things we won't even know about them until you know, until we come up with new technology in the future. So sample return is really expensive. Um, you look at the um, intention to bring samples back from Mars, for example. Um, so um, the uh, future missions to Mars and to collect samples and then get them back up into orbit around Mars. So it's estimated around $4 billion to get them back into orbit around Mars. That's just into orbit, not bringing them back Yikes. to Earth. 
So it's a lot of money. Um, so you know, it's it's uh, to spend that sort of money. There's got to be some serious um, scientific value in it. Um, so yeah, you're right. There are certain things we can do without bringing back samples, but some stuff we simply can't. And they do have immense value once we get them back on Earth. I guess the other thing to consider, of course, is with Mars, we know what's there pretty well. We've sent lots of rovers in the past. We've studied it with uh, satellites and um, observations like that. With asteroids, until you get there, you don't necessarily know what instruments you're going oh, yeah. to need to yeah. analyze them properly. So. Absolutely, and this is this is you know this is true. If you just think of of um, pioneering probes that we've sent i'm not talking about the pioneer probes. i'm talking about all probes that we're pioneering <laughs> right so you think of the pioneering probes that have been sent out, all of the voyages the galileos the the viking missions all of these things that have been sent to various parts around the solar system most recently you know uh, when we, we we sent a little probe out to to um, pluto every time it happens we end up learning stuff that we didn't even conceive to ask about to wonder about mm. um you know we just just think of how our image of pluto has changed as a result of that mission. I mean, you know, we don't know until we go there. But if you can go there and actually get stuff and bring it back, oh, you know, this is – talk about tre treasure trove. That, that, that's really that's, – that's where it's at right now. Absolutely. Okay, Penny, let's move on. This is getting very dry, very outer spacey. <laughs> Give us some biology. Let's talk about echidnas, or spiny anteaters as they're also known. They're very, very cute, but they're also very, very prickly little creatures native to Australia and New Guinea. And like all native Australian animals, they're highly sought after in the illegal pet trade. So what are, what are wildlife forensic scientists at the Australian Museum in Sydney doing about it? Well, what they've realised is that a lot of the echidnas that are being sold on the pet trade, in the pet trade, are advertised as being bred in captivity. Now, okay. so that sounds okay, fair enough, captive bred. However, in Australian zoos, fewer than 30 puggles or baby echidnas have been born in the last 10 years. And presumably I'm going to put it out there and say, look, zoos are kind of experts at captive breeding. And yet apparently there's up to 150 short-beaked echidnas for sale a year. Wow. So, mmm. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Sounds a bit suspicious. Sounds a bit suspicious. <laughs> but so the math, what, the math. Been, yeah, I know, right? And look, I know that you can say, oh, well, maybe someone's just really good at it. But there are these reasons why um, echidnas are difficult to breed in captivity, um, which I'm just going to go into because I know I've read these before, but every time I'm just reminded of how interesting the mating habits of the echidna are. So what they do is because the females only breed every couple of years, um, what can happen is that up to 11 male echidnas will follow a female for about up to six weeks in what's called a love train. So the males are going to... We call that stalking the human realm. Well, you know, I guess, how do you say I love you in echidna? So the males will like <laughs> bump the other males out of the way and keep on nudging the female to see if she's receptive and then they have group sex. So <laughs> Of course, okay. Because I guess if there's, you know, there's always a fewer there's always fewer females breeding than available males. So this ensures that, you know, someone one of the males is going to have a baby and she only lays one egg a season. Wow. And most of the puggles don't survive past a year. So it's really kind of unlikely that there's secret captive breathing um, things that are really going great. Um, like, for example, at Taronga Zoo, they announced the birth of two little puggles last year. Um, they're the seventh and eighth to be born at the zoo. Previously, they were born in 2016 and 1987. So, so sorry, I feel how like... How often did you say the females breed? How, um, how that... Every couple of years. So every so, couple of years yeah. and they only lay one egg. One egg. Every couple of years. Yeah. Yeah, that's not a sustainable it's, it's, <laughs> it's approach. Like, presumably it's been sustainable for several million years. Well, but yeah, but in terms of to make a, a market of, out of it, to make, to, oh, to make oh, 150. Point, sorry, from uh, the point of a... Um, 
an illegal echidna smuggler. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's quite likely that these echidnas are caught from the wild, the ones that are in the mm. pet trade. Um, so what's been developed is a DNA test using echidna quills, which I guess are um, you know easily accessible, and it tests the mitochondrial DNA. And what it will show is um, if because it gives mitochondrial DNA is passed down from mother to offspring, so it's quite good at letting you do, sort of infer relationships and ancestry. So it can kind of show if the echidnas were were captive bred, if they were wild caught, um, if it was from Southeast Asia or from, you know, elsewhere, and also to try and pinpoint like where these echidnas are being taken from so that law enforcement can monitor those hotspots. So I thought that was pretty cool. I think... Um, it's apparently quite a fast and effective way of identifying illegal trade. And I guess also I'm sure not all of these echidnas are traded as pets. I'm fairly certain knowing, unfortunately, people that you can probably buy echidna products, yeah. which is, yeah, why it's probably good to be able to test something like mitochondrial DNA, which is um, easy to est- extract from these different products. Yeah. So um, I assume what they'd be doing is getting a sample of the DNA yeah. and then comparing that to like a Com- database of yeah. uh, known, uh, known echidna DNA echidna and then look for similarities. So this mm. is probably from, you know, related yeah, t- to these ones that we've or previously Or Tasmanian or oh, these ones we know that is from captivity. But, I mean, it really does seem unlikely mm. that... Um, that they're a new population that, that we don't know about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I thought that was kind of cool. And I do like any story that reminds me of echidnas. They're such a weird animal. And so, yeah. I like any story that reminds me that the term for a baby echidna is puggle. puggle. I know. And and any story that answers the question of how do echidnas mate? Because I always thought the answer (laughs) to that was carefully. Carefully. (laughs) Yeah. No, they just go all in. No, they just go for it. They're just there. They're like, yep, bring it. But also, I can't help thinking that this is the sort of technology or uh, technique, I guess, that isn't just going to be echidna specific. You could probably use that to trace ivory to different elephant populations that we know about and, you know, other sort of endangered animals that are illegally sold. You can yeah, and I think, build I up think a database. It already, it already has. And mm-hmm. I guess like those trades are a lot more valuable than the echidna trade. But I mean... Echidnas are still valuable, like, Course. per se. So it's good that there's a cheap way of kind of tracking what's going on with them. I, I, did you did you say the, the value in this story of the, the illegal wildlife trade? Did you mention that before? No, I didn't mention that. So, that, so it's valued at approximately $23 billion. That was back in 2014. That's illegal trade in wildlife worldwide. That's so that's not just, just mind blowing. Okay. Not just a kidnap. Right. No, no, no. <laughs> no. God, I'd go and catch me a big. No. I've got to be honest true. with you. I would never do that. <laughs> I love a kidnap, but uh, there's two of them that live around my property. And you know, if, that's <laughs> if you could get like a hundred million for one of those bad boys, like <laughs> take one for the team, a kidnap. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't. I shouldn't even joke about it. Like yeah, it's very immoral. It's, but I, sorry, people. <laughs> Don't don't do this at home. Don't yeah. illegally trade echidnas. Echidnas, they're not worth a hundred million each. That was just a lie. No, that's right. Yeah, but they're worth far more than that to society and science. Mm. Okay, uh, so from that to something of a of a farce, I guess, and it was promoted as the largest reality TV experience in history one of the most ambitious private enterprises of our time. It was the Mars One plan that claimed it would land the first humans on Mars and leave them there on a one-way trip, leave them there to establish a permanent human colony. Well, in news that probably hasn't surprised very many people, the for-profit arm of this venture has just filed for bankruptcy and been dissolved. And Lucas, there are no humans on Mars yet, are there? Look, if they're if they're there, you're not supposed to hesitate on that. The, the re, <laughs> if they are there as a result of this venture, the reality TV show was not well publicised. 
Oh, I totally missed it. I, I just totally missed it. I can see why it went bankrupt. <laughs> yeah, it was just, I mean, they, I, the thing, okay, so we talked about this when when it was first announced, right? We, we covered yeah, this like on the show. 13, yeah. Something like that. And, and you know, the, we expressed some some um, cynicism, I guess you'd say. We weren't skepticism. really. Skepticism. It's always good to be skeptical. We thought it was it was overly ambitious, and and if you recall, one of the things that we we were discussing was the very small budgets that were involved. I mean, they were they were quite mm. they were talking millions of dollars, not billions of dollars in terms of funding. Which is, you know, what I mean. That's I mean, I just talked before about what it would cost to get samples, rocks off the surface of Mars into orbit of Mars is is you know in the realms of about four billion dollars in today's dollars. So. We were, we were a little bit skeptical, as were many. Um, what I found really interesting about this is that there was no fanfare, no announcement about this. In fact, it would have gone unnoticed were it not for um, some dude on Reddit who happened to notice the filing with uh, with with the Swiss, um, I forget what they're called, but the organisation that handles bankruptcies, uh, bankruptcies, and a Swiss newspaper then picked it up and, and went with it to say, "Oh yeah, this has gone. This is now filed for bankruptcy." So, so Lansdorp, the the guy behind the whole thing, Baz Lansdorp, he then um, issued a press release um, saying, "Oh yeah, that 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 part of the 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 group, the Mars One project, that part has indeed." Is is indeed under um, administration now. Um, so, but the other part isn't. Where the other part's fine. It's like, what is going on here? But it really, it, it it's really stank of just trying to go under the mm. the radar to me. That that's how it certainly uh, seemed. So, cover up. It, I don't want to say cover up, but it certainly didn't. It's oh, not like they were. I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's on record. You've said it now. Yeah, it, it was it was sus. It was really sus that it just you know there was nothing about it. And then when they were um, pulled up on it, you know the the press release was kind of cagey in my opinion as well as to um, you know coming clean on what's going on. So what now? Uh, apparently they're saying it's under administration, which is different from bankruptcy. Um, so administration, if I'm correct in my understanding, is about okay. How do we how do we keep this thing going? Is it is it can we make this solvent or not? Um, whereas bankruptcy proceedings are a whole different kettle of fish, where it's about paying out creditors and stuff like that and selling off assets to do so. As, that's my understanding, and I may be um, I may be oversimplifying that. Well, but yeah, I think that, that there were two separate sort of organisations involved, and one was the the sort of the private. Um, that was going to have the reality TV and all that sort of stuff. And I think the other was a, a crowdfunding uh, version. And yes. the the for-profit one uh, has been, I believe, dissolved uh, by the Swiss court. Yes. That, uh, made that, so so that, ha- that is dissolved. That's not just under administration. Oh, if that would be okay. Gone. No, that was not my understanding. Well, the, the, the listing uh, in the Swiss newspaper reads... By decision of 15 January 2019, the civil court of the city of Basel declared the company bankrupt with effect from 15 January 2019, 3.37 p.m., thus dissolving it. So, okay. I don't know. That could also just be a newspaper interpretation of the ruling. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I yeah, okay. Yep. I don't know enough about that to, to comment any further. But like I said, so that's the... The private arm of this, so I don't know what they're talking yeah. about in terms of whether the crowdfunding is going to keep on happening, whether people are going to no. get their money back that they've contributed to there. So Baz said that the the other part is fine; it's it's still solvent, it's still operating. So so the one that the, the one that's bankrupt now allegedly they is just Mars. need a lot more money now, <laughs> right? Yeah. So Mars One Ventures, which was the for profit one, a part part of of Mars One, that's the bankrupt one. But the other one right. is still is still operating. So yeah, um, whatever that means, uh, I don't think it'll have any impact on the on the eventual outcome because once again, we still don't think it'll happen at any point the, through this project. I, I think um, the, our initial skepticism was also driven by the timetable that they had. So in twenty, uh, the the plan was to start 
searching for people in 2015. And I think that sort of happened or they, they were whittling it down to about 100 yeah. people. Well, a whole lot of people went, yep, I'm, a, I'm up for it. But they were planning to have a communication satellite and lander uh, launched in 2016. They were going to have a rover launched in 2018, a second rover in 2020. You know, like we're nowhere near any of that. So they, they couldn't get any of the funding or any of the rovers and plans off the ground. But, you know, it's a shame when people, I think, are led to believe something is going to happen and then the rug is pulled away from under them sort of thing, which is what this happened. It's, it reminds me a lot of the Fire Festival, if anyone's seen the documentary on Netflix or Hulu about that um, travesty. But. Yeah, I, in fact, there's, there's a story on Universe Today where they actually compared it to that, exactly that, the fire okay. festival. Yeah, um, which uh, I haven't seen the show yet, but I've, I was very, very You should. Mm. You should. It's a um, – I can't use the words that I was going to use on <laughs> this podcast, but it is a monumental disaster on all <laughs> I can, fronts. I can imagine the <laughs> words you were going to use. <laughs> Well, cluster was involved in the word. Um, well, let's move on to something that could actually be quite the huge success. And Penny, every year we need to get a new flu vaccine because that virus mutates every year and immunity gained this year might not be effective next year. And Australian scientists may have found a way of developing what's being dubbed as a universal flu vaccine that would work against all strains. This sounds fantastic and it almost sounds too good to be true. Is it? Um, look, I have to confess my immunology is not strong enough to understand. I feel at this stage, I was like, oh, sweet. Yes. No more flu shots. <laughs> or like, sorry, one more flu shot, but we're not quite at that stage yet. Because I mean, we all know we should get a flu shot every year or we, mm -hmm. most of us know that. Um, some people probably think, oh, you've, I've had a flu shot, I'm fine forever. Some people don't like needles or they just, it just slips their mind because every year it just seems to come around quicker and quicker and it's just another thing to do and so on. I so, get it every year just to top up my autism levels. <laughs> well, oh, I so I'm sorry. <laughs> and interestingly, you know, I wasn't even talking about anti-vaxxers, like just mm. your average person, oh, I feel yeah. like... People are pretty good with the childhood immunizations, but you know, after that, it can get tricky. So, so many people I know say, um, every time I've had the flu shot, I've got the flu. I like, get no, the flu. You haven't got no, the flu. You didn't. You've got a, you you've would got an know immune if response. you had the flu. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I know. Well, you've got a cold and you think it's the flu. <laughs> but anyway, what's interesting about the flu is I'm sure we've all heard of like, you know, the different like H1N1, H2N3 and the flu actually mutates quite frequently, which is why it's such a difficult thing to vaccinate against. So, you know, every year you get like a few more strains of the flu and you don't know which one's going to be most dominant, which one it's worth developing a vaccine for and so on. And there's also different substrains um, of influenza which, you know, affect different groups like children and elderly people differently. So some that are not so serious for, you know, healthy adults can really strike down vulnerable people. So there's all, there's, there's, I feel like if we had like a flu expert, there's a lot that goes into deciding which flu vaccine mm. are we going to make because um, it's important to get the vaccine out before flu, vac flu season really starts. So what this breakthrough is is it's done by um, identifying parts of the virus that are shared across all the strains of the flu. So it's essentially been described, like it's one of those needle in a haystack things. What is um, common to all the flu? And then... But also not common to other not cells. Not common to other cells yeah. and your self cells that your immune system... <laughs> will go, actually, you know what, that's part of me, not touching that unless you've got allergies and which, you know. So it's quite tricky. So they've identified some of these parts, but also parts that will trigger like a response in a healthy human and in adults and children. So the cells that they're looking at are called killer T cells. Now, I love 
learning about the immune system. I can't say I remember it. The whole thing lends itself to, you know, battle metaphors and this and that. But what these killer T cells, they're, they're cells that go around in your bloodstream and they, they well, they're alerted to by other cells, like there's cells upon cells upon cells that, that a cell has been infected by a virus and they go and they can essentially just kill the cell. So if because viruses need cells to reproduce in, if the cell that they're in is killed, then they can't reproduce and that's a good way of your body getting rid of a viral infection. So the problem with this, this all sounds great, there's a part that's um, on all flus that these and that, that some T cells can recognise. So if we get, you know, we can you vaccinate for that particular to activate that particular kind of T cell, then you're vaccinated against the flu. Yay. Oh, sounds good. Except. Oh. Great. Done. Got it. <laughs> Only about 50% of people actually have that kind of T cell. Now, I haven't been able to find much that I personally could understand explaining this, but from what I remember, the way that we have all of these different kinds of T cells is we don't have like – DNA instructions, you know, inside us. This is how you make a cell to fight against the flu. This is how you made a fight, make a, a cell to fight against measles. This is how you make a cell to fight against this other kind of measles. Mm -hmm. Essentially, there's a whole bunch of DNA that when the cells are dividing, gets essentially just randomized and chopped and changed. So you start with a package of DNA and this process called clonal selection, um, gets a virtually, but not quite, unlimited array of antibodies by essentially just chopping up a section of DNA during cell division, getting all sorts of different kinds of uh, cells or with, with different kinds of antibodies on them. And then with those ones that are stimulated will then make more. So mm -hmm. the problem with this is not all populations of humans have this particular kind of T cell or can make this kind of T cell. So I'm going to guess it wasn't said that the the population of the test, because this was done in Australia, was probably, um, you know, a pretty representative cross-section of the Australian population, but there are certain groups where this is not going to necessarily be helpful. One is Indigenous Australians and also mentioned was Indi Indigenous Alaskans who just might not have that same immune response and are also at high risk of the flu. So, um, mm -hmm. however, the good news is that, I mean, A, we're probably not going to see a universal vaccine anytime really soon, but B, this method can be applied to other groups. So if there's one point, if there's one um, sort of, you know, region that I'm going to guess vaguely Eurasian people can fight against, then there might be another kind of T cell that other ethnic groups have that can fight, that can target a different region. And I think this is a real um, story in a way about big data and just looking at the whole flu, everything, not those particular, you know, H and N mm -hmm. neuropeptides. I think they're called neuropeptides. Well, anyway, but, um, you know, looking at the whole virus and finding mm. a way of getting, because, I mean, the flu, I mean, I always wonder, you know, because when is it going to be the next really bad flu sort of, I can never remember the difference between an epidemic and a pandemic, but yeah. So, so a pandemic is the bad, is the, is when an epidemic basically spreads across the world. And an epidemic uh, is, is um, when you have a, an outbreak in a particular region. Oh, and then pandemic is it just grows. It just yeah. crosses borders. Yeah. It's an Uber yeah, everyone epidemic. dies. Yeah. In, in the simplest right. terms, there's a more structured yeah. uh, definition. But yeah. Mm. but, yeah, I mean, even the article that I was reading talks about how just the current um, North Hemisphere uh, flu season yeah. has killed a 1,000 people in France in itself. Yeah. Um, so that's just one country, and obviously we're talking about a global phenomenon every year. So anything that can be done to reduce that and also – yeah, if it's one shot as opposed to every single year, people are more likely well, to get it. I think because I've also heard that, you know, a risk factor for not getting vaccinated is like being a fourth kid because people get busy mm -hmm. and these things just slip off the radar. Like, <laughs> you're laughing, Luke. No, I'm just thinking that probably good we only had three then because uh, 
There you go. <laughs> As the fourth child, there's nothing good about yeah. that. <laughs> there's nothing good about that. Oh, but I'm presuming that you're vaccinated. I am fully so. vaxxed. Yes. Good for you. But look, as much as I love vaccination, I would love to do it less, of course. but more of course. usefully. Yeah. So fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Something really useful comes. In yeah, this. and even if um, they do make the version that's universal but only works for fifty percent of people. I'll still take that. That's still a good start. So, Fingers crossed. Yeah. Okay, and on that note, I think that's our show. As always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 324. Don't forget to check out scienceontop.com slash donate to become a Patreon. For this week and the next three, we're giving all donations to Penelope Green's favourite charities, Doctors Without Borders, and the Fred Hollows Foundation. So thank you very much, as always, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Moving on to a different topic. Is a $6 billion budget really enough for such a complex mission? Well, NASA's lowest cost estimate that I have ever seen is about $35 uh, billion US dollars. But let's not forget that Mars One's mission is completely different. We are organizing a mission of permanent settlement, so we do not need to worry about the return trip. And that's really where most of the complexity is. It's in developing bigger rockets to get the systems to Mars, a bigger landing system to land the huge components for the return mission on Mars, and of course developing a whole new launch system that can launch from Mars, while even on Earth launch is so difficult. Our six billion cost figure comes from good discussions that we've had with established aerospace companies from around the world that have already been building systems like this for the ISS, uh, for, for unmanned missions to Mars, and we're very confident that our budget will be enough.